want to go ahead and introduce the board want to introduce themselves? I'm, I don't know. I'm Lisa Floyd. I'm the chair of the White River Union District Board. I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the vice chair of the board. How are we doing? I'm Rodney Greenfield, school board member. Jess Ryan, school board member. Bruce Riley, school board member. Lisa McCrory, school board member and clerk. Bruce Lab superintendent. Tara Weatherell, the business manager. Ted Matthews, director of special education. Owen Bradley, White River Valley Middle School principal. Go Wildcat. <laughs> Andrew Bowen, Bethel Elementary principal. Reed McCracken, high school principal. And David Wells, South Royalton Elementary School principal. Okay, then I will go ahead and formally call the meeting to order. It's 607. And we'll start by the, uh, standing and doing the Pledge of Allegiance. nominations for school district treasurer. 
Okay, seeing none, uh, nominations are closed. We can vote. All those in favor of electing Pam Brown to serve as school district treasurer for the following year, please do so by signifying, uh, signify by raising your cards. Those opposed? It looks like Pam Brown has been voted in as our school district treasurer. Article four, to fix the salaries of the school district officers for the 2020-2021 school year. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, Bush Rod Powers. I do need to identify the person making the motion. So Bush Rod Powers, you moved. Do I have a second? Okay, uh, Rick Benson has seconded the motion. So the motion that's been made and seconded is to fix the salaries of the school district officers for the 2020-2021 school year. All those in favor, please show by raising your card. Those opposed? It looks like the motion's going to carry. And the motion does carry. Article five, to hear and act upon the reports of the school district directors and officers. Do I have a motion? Okay, it's been moved in your name, sir. Steve Hall has moved. Is there a second? Second in your name, sir. Chris Maybe. Chris Maybe has seconded. So we have a motion and a second to hear and act upon the reports of the school district directors and officers. Is there any discussion? So we have a brief presentation to share with you first um, about some of the things that have happened in our schools in the past year, uh, which will be presented by Principal David Wells, although all the principals collaborated in creating this presentation. And then we'll take the presentation back to share about the budget and the process to this point. Good evening again, everyone. Um, the four principals and I uh, want to take a moment to share with you some of the things um, that we've done in our schools on both campuses over the past year. And um, I'll go ahead and do that right now. We really think of ourselves, even though, as you know, there's a Bethel campus and a South Royalton campus as one school, and we um, do a lot of initiatives together as one school. And our school-wide initiatives, um, we implemented multi-tiered systems of supports for our students, and we hired uh, two coordinators for that to better support our students. We implemented a new literacy program in grades K through five. We realize that more and more of our students come to us with backgrounds where they've experienced traumas of many different types, and we've engaged with a trainer to um, have teachers, all the teachers from both campuses, um, learn to know how they can better support students who have experienced trauma. Of course, safety is a paramount concern for us. And in the um, August, actually, the very beginning of the year, we use a new training that is used across the state of Vermont and is recommended by all the authorities of Vermont. It's called the Alice Training. It's a new adaptive way to deal with um, crises of intruders into the school and be more um, proactive about it. Another highlight, we have our ECO, which is Environmental Education Outdoors, and that program is expanding. It started on the Bethel campus, came over to the South Royalton campus last year in the elementary grades. It's built into the middle school, and then in the budget that you'll see, um, it's proposed to um, start with the high school as well, um, to have our students learn and benefit from the natural environment that we're in. I'm going to talk a little bit more about initiatives in the elementary schools um, a, a really huge um, improvement and, and big program for us has been to adopt and, and to train on a new reading program for grades K through five. Um, and this aligns our practices on both campuses and within the whole supervisor union, but with us on both campuses. Um, all of our teachers have received training. Many of them have taken courses in this sponsored by the supervisor union. 
every single classroom has new materials. Um, and these new programs were paid for um, a, a lion's share from Medicaid funding that the uh, district and supervisory union had. Um, and then um, Bethel and South Royalton, um, we went further and secured a $50,000 grant to make sure that we had as much of the materials as possible to grade five. And, and we're already starting to see um, the fruits of our labors. Um, we're seeing now that our, our kindergarten students now are performing better now than many of them were performing at last June. And across the supervisory union, our students have seen a 16% growth in their reading ability. We've expanded our world language instruction um, so now that it is on both campuses, so students in grades K through five have world language instruction where they're learning Spanish. And we're expanding preschool programs, again, on both campuses, so that four-year-olds have full-day options and um, expanded options for three-year-old children. And um, our plans going forth in the future is to have further expansions of our preschool program um, because there are so many uh, children in need and, and we want to get them off to a good start. The middle school has spent a lot of time having teachers work together um, to do things as a team, to integrate their learning and their teaching, um, and they're using a learning block. And they really want the students to be reflective at this middle school age as to what it means to be a learner, how do they learn, and what are their goals. And one of the ways to pull all the middle school students together has been a book study group um, where all of the students are reading the benefits of being an octopus, and they're gonna work with that author as well. At the high school, um, we're working on improving our programs and improving our offerings for students. Um, one example is that um, we are going forward with strong um, AP classes, and we added a pre-AP English class. The high school faculty has been doing a lot of work through all of its trainings and, and a lot of its time together to work on personalized learning and individual pathways to college and career helping the students take more charge of their learning and, and have more of a direction. Our community-based learning program continues to be strong, where students have personalized learning plans. They're going on job shadowing this spring for all ninth graders, but all throughout the year we have students um, job shadowing all over the area. And, last but not least, uh, we attain uh, the Division IV softball and baseball championships as a newly merged team. Wildcats hit it out of the park for a season. Um, continuing on with co-curriculars, um, our music enrollment is strong and growing. We've added a jazz band, and we have the prep band shown here. Um, the School of Rock musical is coming to our stage, so musicals are returning um, to the White River Valley School and it will be performed the first weekend in April. Um, the middle school uh, performed their first theater production. We've added sports like bass fishing and indoor track, and they're very popular. And then we have our traditional events like our Cancer Awareness Day that are still strong and grow community. We've also been paying attention to the buildings um, and working with the school board. Um, we were able to put a new roof on the majority of the South Royalton building. Um, we're being systematic and completing asbestos removal um, in um, the South Royalton cafeteria and in two classrooms. Things that, that never, you know, it needed to be done, but things like pipes in the ceiling that really should have been out of there, um, the insulation is taken out. Um, we've expanded a restorative classroom in the middle school to have more space for the restorative program. Back in South Royalton, um, we replaced three of our hot water heating tanks because one of them had failed and all of them were aging, so we made the decision to uh, think forward and replace them. And we installed a new stage curtain and rigging for the high school stage. So we thank the community for their support and uh, for taking time to hear our report this evening. So uh, again, I'm Chris Riley, I'm a school board member. Uh, I'm going to present a few of the slides on how we 
to build the budget to where we are, and then also Andrew Jones is going to come up after me and, 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 and speak some more to the current or to our proposed budget for this current coming year. Um, so the first slide that we have here is on uh, the FY19 audit. So this is from last year's school year, so from the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, so the audit uh, that was done uh, has shown a deficit of $350,000 uh, and um, there was uh, some of the reasons for this deficit that we've uh, that has been found in the audit was there was a, uh, a shortfall in, in the actual tuition revenue that we got uh, in terms of what we had projected for tuition students coming to the school uh, and what was the number of students that actually matriculated to our school. Uh, so that uh, was a shortfall of $105,000 versus what we had budgeted. Uh, there was also uh, issues with the HRA budgeting, so the, uh, for our health uh, insurance savings accounts uh, or, or reimbursements accounts. Uh, so uh, it wasn't budgeted to the proper levels or funded to the proper levels, and so there was a budget uh, shortfall of $50,000 versus what was again, budgeted. So. Um, there was also, at the SU level, um, because of things like health insurance and the HRA issues that we saw at the local level, uh, the SU saw the same sort of issues as well. And again, we pay our portion of the, of the SU's budget, uh, and because of the, uh, of the budget uh, differences uh, between what was spent and what was actually budgeted, uh, there was a $104,000 that we had to contribute into the SU uh, to help cover their uh, budget difference. Uh, for special education, uh, it was the same type of issue, so there was $100,000 uh, difference versus what was budgeted uh, that we had to contribute to help uh, uh, cover that, our portion of that uh, difference. Uh, at the school level, uh, at the South Royalton campus, when we were building the budget, we had originally planned on one less position in the front office of the school. Uh, and then as the, as the school year was going on, we found that that uh, was uh, you know, um, an understaffing uh, issue that came about, and so we had to refill that position, and we hadn't budgeted for it. Uh, so there was $50,000 of uh, overage in terms of what was spent versus what was budgeted. Uh, this year, we also had to go out for new maintenance and grounds contracts, and those actually came back higher uh, than what we had expected in terms of the cost for uh, grounds maintenance uh, and snow plowing. Uh, so there was again a $50,000 difference versus what was budgeted. Uh, and then there was some additional merger facilities work that was done uh, that was again another $50,000 of difference. So uh, for a total again of uh, $350,000 in deficit uh, versus what we had budgeted for. So in response to what the budget uh, or the audit was showing uh, for the current school year, so the FY1920 school year, uh, we have been limiting spending on campus uh, uh, for any non-essential uh, spending requests uh, that, uh, uh, that come up, uh, and we're trying to absorb as much of that deficit this current year as we can uh, without it having any real impact on the students. So, it's not to say that there's a spending freeze, but as, as there are budget requests that come through, the administration is looking at those requests and approving the ones that are deemed to be necessary. And then for the, I guess for the current budget year two, while well, it was last year, there was a, uh, a deficit on, uh, on the student tuition. This current year, for the current year we're physically in, we're actually projecting that we're going to have, that we have more tuition students than what we had actually budgeted for our current year. So on next year's budget, we should see uh, actually a, a, a surplus from that uh, is what our expectation is. So given the deficit uh, that, with, that the auditing found uh, and coming into our budget process for this year, um, our goal, as we had stated last year, was to uh, to keep an equalized uh, tax rate uh, level uh, and uh, or to keep our equalized tax rate level. Uh, and so when we were going through the budget, on the first draft of the budget uh, for our FY20 budget that we're proposing, uh, you know, when we took into account all of the contracted staff raises, health insurance increases, uh, and then also, uh, well, the, the health insurance increases that were projected, those alone brought or increased our budget by 7%. 
Um, you know, in response to that, we did look, we did, did go through and we decreased all of our non-staff spending. Uh, we also cleaned up the budget uh, and that left us then, once we removed anything that was you know, deemed to be you know, over budgeted, uh, that left us at a 3% increase versus uh, last year's budget. Uh, and so we've also, uh, along with that, we've looked at reducing our staffing by 2.7 full-time equivalents. Uh, so trimming the elementary staff in both uh, locations, both uh, sites, Royalton and Bethel, uh, to match our student levels uh, more appropriately in terms of appropriate class sizes for student-to-teacher ratios, um, and uh, to get to an even rate before uh, the incentive, before any incentives, uh, any incentive decrease, and then before the CLA is applied. So. Uh, there are further cuts that we considered that would bring us down to completely level funding from last year to this year, uh, but we felt that those terms, those cuts would have too much of a negative impact on our students, uh, and that wasn't the result that we want to see. We want to bring forward uh, a program for our students in the schools uh, that gives them the education that they deserve, and we don't want to take away uh, the things that, you know, as uh, uh, Principal Wells presented in the slide some of the new things and uh, additional things that we've been offering to the students. So, uh, you know, we just couldn't, uh, you know, in good conscience, bring that forward. Uh, not to say that we can't if we need to, but uh, uh, but this is the, you know, we wanted to bring forward the budget that we believed in. Uh, so. All right. I'm Andrew Jones. I'm going to be going over what all this results in as far as the tax rates and actual numbers. Um, so, going briefly through the actual spending changes that we looked at or that went into this budget, um, the, we budgeted staff raises about 3%. These still need to be negotiated, so the final number might be that, it might be a little different, but that's a ballpark of what we are expecting as far as um, what the staff salary increases are going to be. Um, health insurance costs were up 12% this year, which was a major um, thing that we have to deal with, and that's something everybody across the state is dealing with. Um, our SPED assessment is up $138,000, which was um, partially due to um, just you know, saying health insurance increases and uh, also uh, increased needs, but also we have um, a higher student population relative to the rest of the SE, so our percentage that we need to pay was up a little bit, so that increased that, at that added to the assessment a little bit. Um, and our SU assessment is up 7.5%. Um, you know, this was the first year that we had um, actual spending numbers from the, um, from since the merger. So um, a lot of the accounts kind of got rebalanced because there was a new chart of accounts that um, was also adopted at the same time that we did the merger. So. Some things were being budgeted in categories, but being spent in other categories. So part of the budget process this year was going through and making sure that what we're budgeting for is actually matching the categories and the levels that they're being spent at. So some, if you look at the budgets that you know were sent out, there's some categories where things go down, but it's not a real cut. It's just because they were transferred to other categories or something like that. Um, so in addition to that, there were some places where we did decrease spending things like field trips, equipment, books, and supplies. We tried to limit um, the non-staff spending as much as we could to try and keep um, you know, the staffing levels as uh, strong as we could. And, but we did reduce elementary staff by two to closer match recommended class sizes. And then there was the 0.7, which um, came off from basically attrition. So the end result was um, spending was up about two hundred eighty thousand dollars, from eleven point eight million to twelve point one. For revenue changes, our tuition um, projected tuition revenue was up one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. So last year we just took the level that we gotten for FY nineteen and used that for our tuition revenue, and we did get a stronger freshman class than we had in FY nineteen. So um, in FY twenty we're going to be ex exceeding the amount that we budgeted um, for the amount of tuition we're getting in. So we're basically just continuing that on. So um, 
the amount of tuition revenue we got was just taking the current students that we got for tuition revenue, uh, tuition students, and projecting them forward a year older, and then adding in five new freshmen. And for a comparison, we have 15 new freshmen this year. So this should be a, um, even with the increased level, this should be a um, conservative projection for how much we should be able to bring in. Um, but the increase in tuition revenue, uh, projected tuition revenue is offset a little bit by fun federal funds being decreased by $60,000. And in the previous budget, we had a um, balance carryover of, of, from the previous surplus of $55,000. We no longer have any surplus to carry in, so that's out of this budget. So the revenue is up um, about $50,000 this year. Um, the final thing that goes into per pupil spending is how many pupils you have. And so the graph on the left shows the equalized pupils. Um, and those basically held steady. Um, so we didn't gain many, or we just had a very slight decrease in equalized pupils. Um, the equalized pupil is calculated from a two year average of the average daily uh, membership. And just looking at that, it shows one way that being a combined school helps both of our towns out. Um, so last year, Bethel had had a decrease in um, enrollment. Well, Royalton, you know, helped keep the numbers up with an increase. This year, Royalton was down 10%, whereas Bethel was up 8%. So it wound up canceling out pretty much. Um, whereas, you know, each individual town, an individual town trying to deal with a 10% decrease in enrollment would be pretty difficult. So having the combined of the two towns working together helps even these things out. Um, to go into how this all calculates out into t a tax rate, um, we'll first go over the per pupil spending, which is the spending minus the revenue divided by the equalized pupils, and then see how we calculate the equalized rate, which is taking that per pupil spending and divided by the state yield factor, and uh, subtracting the merger incentive, and then we get a final rate by dividing out the common level of appraisal and we'll go over all those things in a little more detail. Um, so yeah, our spending was up 2.4%, our revenue was up about 5%, so our net spending was up 2%. Our equalized people stayed the same, so our per pupil spending is up 2%. So, um, but looking at that compared to the state yield, um, the way the yield works is as the tax base for the state of Vermont increases, the same tax rate will bring in more revenue for the state, so they're able to um, change the rate that they need to assess to the towns um, to you know, reflect what they'll be, need to bring in to pay the statewide education spending. Um, and this yield is uh, projected to increase by 2.2% to reflect that. So, the fact that our per people spending is increasing at the same rate as the yield means that um, our preliminary rate, rate is actually down very, very slightly. So it's basically keeping the preliminary rate even. Um, we're still receiving a merger incentive for um, having merged. And that is going, started at eight cents, it was six cents last year, it's down to four cents this year. So our final equalized rate is up to two cents that the incentive uh, decrease. Um, was uh, had. So that's up 1%. That's our equalized tax rate. So the final rate calculation for each town um, is taking that equalized rate and dividing by the CLA for each town, the common level of appraisal. And that value is based on how um, the assessed values in each town compare to actual sale values. Um, and so that, that'll vary as house prices vary. Um, so both towns had a um, small decrease in the CLA, which leads to the final tax increase being slightly higher. Um, the Royalton um, rate is up more than that, though, because last year um, the Royalton equalized rate had been pinned at capped at 1.6 compared to 1.3 for Bethel. Um, and this year it's not capped anymore, so the royalty rate is going to be increasing more. Um, going forward, the two towns' equalized rates are going to be the same, so we won't have any discrepancy between the equalized rates and any future years. 
this will be the final, uh, or last year was the final one where they were uh, different. So the only difference going forward will be the common level of appraisal values in each town. So that's how it all works out for tax rates. So Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about what we're working on. Well, you're going doing preschool, right? But first, I think Chris is gonna share a little bit about preschool and aftercare options. So uh, I guess as uh, Principal Wells mentioned in his slides earlier too, the, this year we're offering full day uh, preschool for four-year-olds at both the campuses of Bethel and uh, uh, Royalton and that uh, uh, part of what we're looking at uh, potentially offering uh, for next year, we're, there's a survey out to families right now, uh, is to offer uh, potentially uh, some preschool uh, programming for children this summer if there's interest uh, from families and then also next year, uh, again, expanding full day uh, to students, offering that again, uh, and then also looking at the potential of also even offering, offering aftercare uh, for the preschool program. So uh, students would come to school till three o'clock, and the older kids right now, they have the one plan program, but for children that are in the preschool, there isn't any after school uh, care for them, so parents or caregivers have to come and pick them up and then transport them to wherever they need to go to next. Whereas potentially we could offer, if there's enough interest uh, and support for it, offer an after school program that would be, you know, the families would pay a, a fee that would cover the cost of adding it and potentially even generate uh, some small revenue for the school, but offer a consistent one location to offer uh, preschool pro programming and after school care and reduce on that transportation and just disruption to the day for the students and for families and caregivers. You mentioned that people haven't seen the survey. Oh. Yeah, and so yeah, if there are any families out there with preschool age children, uh, if you haven't seen it, there is an email uh, that has gone out with a link to a survey, uh, and I believe the request is to have people re reply to that survey by March 13th. Uh, so. Uh, if you could please uh, uh, respond to that, you know, whether it's something you feel like you're going to utilize or not utilize, but we need the, the information and the survey data to help us understand if this is something that we should continue to pursue and if there is that interest from families to take advantage of something like that. That survey is also available on Facebook or you could contact our schools if you'd like to be emailed the link directly and you haven't already received one. Um, we also are at a place where we're having a supervisory union leadership transition. Um, so we appreciate Bruce Labs and Deb Matthews for the work they've done with us over the last few years. Um, but both of them will be wrapping up their tenure with us at the end of this year. So thank you for all the work you've done for us so far. And we've been going through uh, collaborative and deliberative process to look at hiring a new superintendent and a new director of special education. Um, I believe that there are um, finalists for each category. I've been on the committee that's looking at um, hiring a new superintendent. We went through a process of screening, 13 candidates, um, only three really rose to the top, one of whom withdrew her candidacy um, before we could even interview her. And after interviewing the two other finalists, um, we put forward the, the only finalist we thought would be a really good fit for our community. So you will have an opportunity to meet that candidate on Thursday, 6 p.m. here in this building, and we hope as many people will come out as possible. There will be opportunities using either an app or paper feedback form to give feedback and your thoughts on the candidate. Um, and our finalist, which you may have read in the newspaper, um, is South Royalton native Jamie Canarney, um, who's currently a principal in Williamstown and has been going through um, a leadership program to be ready to be a superintendent when he um, found a spot that he thought would be a good fit for him. So please come out on Thursday um, and have an opportunity to meet our finalist. And that also, um, we want to really make sure that as this leadership transition occurs, 
We're staying focused on our literacy initiative. We've invested an awful lot in that, both in terms of grant money, buying books, getting resources into our schools so that students have access to high quality reading materials. And also our teachers have put an awful lot of time into learning how to help students read um, in different ways to really reach all the learners in their classrooms. So I think that we want to make sure that those efforts continue and as this leadership transition occurs, don't sort of fall by the wayside. And I feel really grateful that we have strong principals who can help us remember that we're in, engaged in that work and teachers too who can continue to carry that forward even though we're having some transition at the supervisory union level. Additionally, we are really grateful tonight is actually Tara Weatherell's one year anniversary with our supervisory union, or maybe it's tomorrow. Yes, yesterday. Yesterday. yesterday, sorry, <laughs> bad with anniversaries. But we have a, a business manager who's been with us for a full year, um, and she has been learning at a remarkable rate in order to take better care of us and help us manage things fiscally in a better way moving forward. So I'm very grateful for that as well. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm going to turn things back over to Allison Fulcher. <laughs> May I ask a question? Yes, we will now open up the floor to any questions. Just please come use the microphone and identify yourself. Louise Clark from Royalton. Um, when we went whipping through that um, series of expenditures, what is SPED? I'm guessing it's special ed, but no, I mean, you just yeah, throw out these um, that's right, special. acronyms, and it's, it's kind of uh, difficult, and that's a heck of a lot of money for that one. And what time on Thursday? 6, 6 p.m. is the community forum on Thursday. Thank you. And SPED is indeed special education. My name is Tim Brennan from Bethel. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just had one question to clarify. I think it's pretty simple. Early on in the discussion of the, um, of the deficit, it said that the total deficit was 350,000, but some just quick summing of the numbers on the slide. It looked like it was closer to 500,000. So uh, the, the discrepancy there, uh, is, is there some uh, explanation of the, the summary. So we started out at, with a surplus at the beginning of the year. So that surplus disappeared, disappeared and then we had the results. Okay. The remaining deficit is too Thanks. Louise Ferrisburg, Bethel. Um, according to my calculation, your actual spent is around 645000 over the budget. So, you know, you take away the three fifty, and you're still almost 300000 over. Um, some of that was because there um, was a built-in deficit. When you bring in surplus money from previous years, you set it so that the amount that you're spending is less than the amount that you bring in, so that you run a deficit to get rid of that surplus. So there was, I believe, $160,000 worth of surplus funds used in the deficit, or in the FY19 budget, which means that even if things had gone exactly according to plan, we would have had a deficit of 100, we would have spent $160,000 more than we brought in, or budgeted for. Does that make sense? No, really. <laughs> so because it doesn't show as being built in. Um, is it a line item in here somewhere? No, it's just, if you look at the budget that was passed, it includes a balanced carryover on the revenue side, but that doesn't show up in the... Um, well, we only side. got 2020 and the, you know, the budget. It didn't give us, going back, some of the revenue far enough back. So I would say that we really should have the same revenue columns that we have for expenditures, then maybe that might make a little more sense. Sure. But you only have budget columns so that it doesn't jive. And my next comment is that 
Last year, there was an increase of almost 211,000 over the preceding budget, and this year it's 270. And Bethel was told that our costs were going to go down when this became a supervisor union, a unified district. It hasn't gone down. It keeps going up and up and up. I want the kids to be educated. I've been in education, but why does the combine keep going up and up? It seems to me that there's something not quite right here. Carl Russell, Bethel. Thank you for uh, all the hard work you put into making this budget what it is. I have some concerns. Uh, primarily, a lot of the discussion that I heard tonight was talking about uh, the difficulty in managing cost overruns, uh, controlling the budget. And I know from experience there's a lot of pressure from the community to force these budgets down. You started out this year with a presumption that you were going to create an even flat funding budget, which um, I would offer is irresponsible. I think that I know that education is a results-based enterprise. It's not like pumping fuel into something and getting so many miles out of it. You have to have a program that raises our children to the level that we want to have them. And for the school, board and the supervisory union to continually cast low budgets that are continually overspent is unrealistic and it creates a, a, a lack of confidence in the community. Uh, if every single year we come back and we're told about over expenditures, it's not, in my mind, directly related to mismanagement. It's also related to unrealistic expectations from the community and the board's willingness to go along with that. So um, I'm willing to support this budget the way it is, but I think moving forward, the community needs to have a more realistic understanding of the cost of education and the value of cost of education. And I'd like to see this board start to um, stand up for the administrators and for the students and to provide real arguments to support the costs that we need to make. Thank you. Is there any more discussion on this article? This is not actually an article we're going to vote on, um, but we can continue to have discussion. I'm Stuart Ketchum from South Royalton. And uh, it's clear that we did put a lot of work into this presentation, enough so that I couldn't understand a lot of it. Um, I have been a small business owner for 45 years until I retired. Um, and as I look, if, if I could try to simplify this and look at it generally, uh, you have revenues and you have expenses. And it appears that most of your revenues are fairly fixed um, if you keep the same personnel. Fixed in the sense that you don't have, you don't have control over it, although they go up. I'm sorry, revenues, I'm talking about expenses. Um, and expenses being fixed or going up uh, because they're not under your control. Um, you talked about students, new students coming in to the high school from sending schools, and that, that there's an improvement this year. Um, but I don't know about what's going to happen in the, the next fiscal year and the one after that. I didn't hear anything said about trying to recruit new freshmen into the school. Did I miss something? We, we didn't include that in this particular presentation, but there have been a lot of efforts um, at every high school recruitment fair in the area. Our administrative team and our student services or guidance counselors have attended 
Um, we've placed some ads. We've reached out when we're doing exciting field trips to have elementary or middle level students from outlying communities join our field trips to get them engaged with our students. Um, and I think our principals could speak more to this too. We, we have been working hard um, to recruit students from those communities. Well, I'm glad that, that you have been working hard. Um, and I don't know if this is possible, but um, um, colleges have fairs and they invite um, prospective new students. And I don't know if the school could do that, if the high school could do that, and maybe even have um, select students who are have some training to um, walk those prospective students through a school day. Um, I do think that there may be some optimism coming with some staffing changes uh, and, um, and administrative changes. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we can continue to recruit more freshmen to South Royalton um, because the descending schools do have a lot of choices and many of those students are going elsewhere. Is there any more discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to Article 6. Shall the voters authorize the school board to borrow money by issuance of notes not in excess of anticipated revenue for the fiscal year July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021? Do I have a motion? So moved. Right. And your name, sir? Joshua Powers. Joshua Powers has moved. Article 6. Is there a second? And who said that? Charlie Bascom? Okay, it's been moved and seconded that uh, the voters shall authorize the school board to borrow money by issuance of notes not in excess of anticipated revenue for the fiscal year July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Is there any discussion? Steve Hall from South Royalton. Um, just have a question is exactly what does this mean and what's it? Do you want to respond to it, Tara? Is this one on? Okay. So this would be the tax anticipation note that we go out to get each year, which provides um, financial support for the district until tax revenue comes in to pay the bills. Okay. Thank you. You didn't hear that? Okay. Can you repeat that, please? Now, the question was, what exactly is, is this article? What, what is the, you know, the, the purpose of this article? And the answer was? It is the tax anticipation note that we get each year, which provides financial support to the district to pay their bills until tax revenue is received from each of the towns and the education spending fund. Is there any further discussion? So we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor of authorizing the school board to borrow money by issuance of notes, not in excess of anticipated revenue for the fiscal year July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, please do so by raising your cards. Those opposed? It appears that the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Article 7, shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $12,098,119, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $18,474.74 per equalized pupil. Again, that was $18,474.74 per equalized pupil. 
this projected spending for equalized pupil is 2.13% higher than spending for the current year. Do I have a motion? And your name, please? Kim Thornton. From Royalton? Yes. Kim Thornton from Royalton has moved the article. Is there a second? Okay, Steve Hall from Royalton has seconded. And the motion on the floor is, shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $12,098,119, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $18,400.74 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 2.13% higher than spending for the current year. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I would ask um, anybody up there who might have the figures, how does this relate or, or uh, match up with spending otherwise for our other students? Populations in the state. I mean, what are the time spent? Does anybody know? I don't have a specific number in terms of per pupil costs. I do know that health care this year has had a significant impact, um, and that some communities are facing. 13% increases, like Essex and the Burlington area, um, because of fixed, fixed costs going in. Um, so I don't know if anyone else could speak to that, but we've really worked hard to keep our spending in line um, and retain programming that we think makes our schools a good place for our students and, and attractive to students from other communities. Um, so is there anyone down the line who has comparisons to other communities and per pupil costs? I'm looking up what's in our district. Okay. Right. All right, Tara's right. looking up what's in our, our district. Statewide spending was expected to raise about 6%, so we didn't come in to anything really under that, so. I'll, I'll make a comment. Okay. okay, they're not able to hear. Seth, can we turn up the volume? The statewide projection was that school spending would increase 6%, so we came in under the state projection for school spending increase for this year. I just wanted to add that I'm also a parent, and I have two kids that are currently in the high school, and Personally, I've been really happy with the quality of the education that our kids have been getting. And since the merger, they've had a lot more opportunity than they would not have had if the merger had not happened. Um, one of our kids would have gone on to early college this year and would not have been an enrolled senior if the schools had not merged because he wouldn't have had opportunities because of the merger, because of the AP classes and other opportunities, and because of the friendships that he's made, he decided to stay and be an enrolled student this year as a senior, which to me is, is a win-win. He made the decision, and, 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 I, and I know that there's other students that have been in the same situation that have made those same decisions. So I'm personally seeing um, a real positive movement and, and some real amazing things happening with our students. So I'm encouraged. And, um, and it was my husband who came up and he made some really good points where we, we should be shooting for what we want instead of trying to show you that we can cut corners and make sure that it doesn't cost any more. We should be focusing on what our students need. We want to grow a healthy, robust community. And, and, and I think we're doing that. But Tara, you have answers. In response to the earlier question? 
I just pulled some of the numbers within our supervisory union to give some perspective. The threshold that the state set for us, that if you go over results in the penalty, is $18,756. Within our supervisory union, the depending if budgets go through or not, it ranges anywhere from $17,184 to $20,486, and that district is specifically a pure tuition only district, so they don't, aren't subject to the threshold penalty. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> okay, seeing none, we can go ahead and vote. Um, if you vote uh, yay, you are voting to support and have the school, you're passing the budget. Um, if you vote nay, then you are um, telling the school board that you are not authorizing this budget. And so the motion that we are now voting on is, uh, will the, are the voters um, approving the school district's school board to expend twelve million ninety-eight thousand one hundred nineteen dollars, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. All those in favor of passing the budget, please do so by raising your cards. Those opposed? The motion does appear to carry. And the motion does carry. <laughs> Article 8, to transact any other business which may legally come before this meeting. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. Um, we did put forward a budget that we believe is in the best interest of our students. I wanted to take an opportunity at this time, um, because as I look around, everyone who will be on the Australian ballot tomorrow is in the room um, running for positions um, for our board seats. So please don't forget to vote tomorrow by Australian ballot for your school board directors. But I'm wondering at this time if the people who are on the ballot would like to say a few words about their candidacy. <laughs> So yeah, that's fine. Um, so if we go ahead to Article 10, um, it's there's three positions. The first is from Royalton uh, Director for a one-year term. Is that candidate here? There's two of us. There, there are two candidates running for that position. Okay. Um, um, would either of you like to speak? Oh, or at least introduce okay. yourself. Okay. Or give me a name. Yeah. <laughs> so, I can, I can start. Okay. Uh, so I'm Jess Ryan. I'm a uh, 98 graduate of South Wales High School. Um, some of you might have seen me with the merger committee, um, the secondary committee. This merger is something that I very much um, began to believe in during that process. And um, after one of the world representatives left um, our town and moved to Bethel, and the word of the deficit got out. Um, being both a taxpayer and a parent in the community, I um, decided to go ahead and volunteer to step onto the school board. Since then, uh, I have seen the hard work and dedication that this board puts forward, both in the budget um, realm and looking at how we educate our children. I have two elementary school students in this community. Um, both of them have benefited greatly from the world languages and from the eco program, and I very much want to see them succeed in the future, which is why I am hoping to stay on this board. And who's opposing? Bob Gray. Bob Gray. <laughs> I'm Bob Gray. I grew up in this area. I've been an, I've been an administrator in um, Fairhaven, in Rochester, um, Bethel, South Woods, and you know, I guess I mentioned Rochester. Um, I have a vast experience in education. I have a lot of knowledge. 
I'd like to use to make or improve the school as much as I could. I also have a lot of budgetary experience and I'd like to utilize that to keep costs and I think it's important for the communities, our communities to survive and be healthy along with having a healthy education system but also we need to make sure our communities are financially healthy. So that's my goal. Thank you. Is there anybody else running for that position? Okay, so then Royalton, uh, one director for a three-year term. On how many candidates are there? Uh, one. one. One, and that is? <laughs> um, I'm Andrew Jones, and I'm running for that position as a write-in, so if anybody's voting tomorrow, they can write my name into the three-year Royalton position. Um, I've been on the board for the last two years, and you know, we've been working hard to deal with this budget and all this other, you know, the other initiatives that we were mentioning, and I'd like to continue the work on. Um, so I appreciate your votes. Thanks. And the final is um, in Bethel, uh, director for a three-year term. I'm not sure how many. Uh, just I, Lisa McCrory. I don't think I have anybody running for the position as well. I think I'm the only one on the ballot at this point, but... Um, I'm running for another three-year seat. I've been on the board for the last two years, and prior to that, I was on the transition committee, and as Jess said, through that process, became really convinced that it was gonna be a good thing for our communities. So, I hope you vote for me. Okay, all right, go ahead. Just, uh, just wanted you to know that we spent the day as an administrative team um, talking about the coronavirus. And uh, if you are a parent here, um, you will either be seeing a memo, um, you've either seen it already or you'll see it tomorrow. Um, I think uh, we, we're gonna take this very seriously. Um, and I just wanted you to know if any of you want to see that memo, we have copies. So I'll put them, put them out for people who want to take one. Thank you. Any other business to discuss under Article 8? Okay, then we'll move on to Article 9. Um, and do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting until 8 a.m.? March 3rd, 2020, when voting by Australian ballot shall commence. Who moved, please? Denise Gilmette. Denise Gilmette moved this article to adjourn. Do I have a second? Steve Hall has seconded it. So there's a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please show by raising your card. We'll see you tomorrow morning.